every nation has an official history. Tales of leadership, stories of heroism and courage. Accounts of battles won and lost, glimpses of hope and glory. But there is another history, the history of ordinary people, of unsung heroes, people who create history through commitment and perseverance, sweat and drudgery. This is their story, the oil people of India, the people who foiled the design to make independent India an economic colony of oil multinationals, the fate of many a developing country. It was a long-drawn battle against formidable adversaries. It is said with good reason that every major war in the past century has been linked to the issue of access to oil. And none realized this better than those who took over the leadership of India on the 15th of August, 1947 as the Union Jack made way for the Indian tricolor. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. A moment comes... The visionary Prime Minister, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, recognized the importance of oil security and declared in Parliament, a country that does not produce its own oil is in a weak position. From the point of view of defense, the absence of oil is a fatal weakness. Prophetic words. As early as June 1948, the government sought the cooperation of the five established foreign oil companies in India. But an American oil multinational surveyed India and declared there is no prospect for oil in India, except for some small reserves in the Northeast. Two American and one British multinational, however, promptly signed agreements in 1952 with the government to import crude for processing in their refineries to be set up in India. The Indian market was sure to grow, and this was the best way to begin the recolonization. The sun had not yet set on the empire of the oil companies. In 1954, Jawaharlal Nehru received a letter from G. L. Mehta India's ambassador to the United States, which described how multinational companies had engineered the political changes in Brazil, which culminated in the suicide of Brazil's president, Vargas. This letter was a moving document and deeply disturbed Pandit Nehru. A firm decision was taken to pursue self-reliance in oil. That very night, Pandit Nehru called his junior minister for natural resources, Keshav Dev Malavia. A new era in India's oil history was about to begin. Post-1955, Malavia emerged a hardliner, a challenger to the foreign oil companies and an initiator of the policy of self-reliance. He was to play a pioneering role in setting up of the national oil industry, but for him, the country's oil scenario of today would have been very different. In a way, he is truly the father of the petroleum industry in India. Meanwhile, the Cold War had begun. The Russians also did a survey of India, and their findings were totally different from what the Americans had said. The Russians said that India has reserves of oil and gas, and exploration and production should be taken up in earnest. On the 13th of December, 1955, Malvia addressed the nation through All India Radio. He declared that prospecting and development of oil is a venture with no guarantee. Nevertheless, the risk is worth taking. India took the risk. The Oil and Natural Gas Directorate was formed towards the end of 1955 with its headquarters at Dehradun, 250 kilometers north of Delhi. AMN Kosh, a superintending geologist of the Geological Survey of India was appointed its first director. The Oil and Natural Gas Commission was born on the 15th of August, 1956. The journey began. 
about 110 young geologists and geophysicists were recruited at a stipend of 250 rupees per month. They were to undergo rigorous training here in the foothills of the Himalayas. S.N. Talukdar was in charge of the training program, a product of the Presidency College, Calcutta, and the Cambridge University. He had recently left a job with the Standard Vacuum Oil Company because he found the Americans misbehaving with the Indian employees. Almost half a century later, Talukdar returns to the campsite at Mohand, a few miles outside Dehradun, with two geologists of the first batch of ONGC, P.K. Srivastava and P.K. Chandra. K.D. Malviya's determination to find oil in the country had become a doctrine of faith, and he would often remind the ONGC people that there is no going back from this determination. If we succeed, we win the race. If we fail, we perish and suffer. Living and training in the jungle for months formed a unique bond amongst these pioneers, a bond visible even after five decades, as they try to remember the song they used to sing together at the campfires. Whatever will be, will be. The future is not in our hands to see. The words may have been forgotten, but the spirit remains as strong as before. When I was a young girl, I asked my mother, what should I be? Will I be pretty? Will I be son? That's what she said to me. Early explorations took ONGC to the foothills of the mighty Himalayas, the Shivaliks. On a cool April morning in 1957, on the slopes of the hill facing the temple dedicated to the fire god at Jwala Mukhi in Himachal Pradesh, drilling began with the rig the Romanians had brought for an exhibition in New Delhi. This was the first deep drilling rig owned by the commission. For centuries, a gas flame had burned brightly at the nearby temple, and hopes were high as the well was spudded on the somewhat risky date of the 1st of April, 1957. Many anxious moments and worries marked this first drilling at Jwalamukhi. Unfortunately, ONGC was not first time lucky. The young geoscientists learned to take disappointment in their stride and move on to the next objective. In 1958, ONGC went to the Kambi region of Gujarat. On the 25th of July, 1958, drilling began at Lunej with a recently purchased Russian turbo drill rig the well, however, did not show any indication of oil or gas, even after drilling to a considerable depth. Alarmed by the drilling results, which were dry so far, a decision was taken at headquarters to terminate the drilling. L.P. Mato, the then director of geology, was instructed to convey the decision to the site. Mato, nevertheless, on his own wisdom, decided to go slow on sending the telegram. In the next two days, oil was struck. ONGC tasted success for the first time. Nehru visited Kambe on 4th April 1960. This was a historic day for Kambe, and thousands had gathered to welcome the Prime Minister, who came with the man of the hour, K.D. Malvia. More than 40 years later, some of the witnesses to that occasion returned to the historic well number one at Lunage. As luck would have it, cell flow had stopped from the well the Prime Minister was to visit. A young engineer, Arana, saved the day. He pumped oil back down the well and kept it under pressure. Jantibai Bapupai was there to open the valve when the Prime Minister came. The oil gushed out and left its mark on the spotless white Sherwani of Nehru who said that he is carrying a good souvenir back to Delhi. It was due to such discoveries in Gujarat that the critics were somewhat silenced. The Eastern economist went on to write that, the striking of oil in Kambe has placed Malvia's entrepreneurship on the only sure basis of success, which is success itself. It is right that those of us, and this includes the Eastern economist, who have often wondered whether the public sector was justified in taking these risks, should admit that, in the result, 
Mr. Malvere has been justified by the events. The government of India decided to grant greater autonomy to the ONGC. The commission was converted into a statutory body on the 15th of October, 1959, under an act of parliament known as Oil and Natural Gas Commission Act. After Lunage, ONGC came to Ankleshwar. After 77 days of drilling on the 14th of May, 1960, well number one at Ankleshwar became a gusher. Local inhabitants of the nearby village, Hajat, were overjoyed with Mother Earth's gift. And taking the sweet, light oil, they lit earthen lamps in their homes. A few days after the discovery, Pandit Nehru and Malvia paid a visit to inaugurate the site. The Prime Minister named the well Vasudhara, meaning the stream of prosperity. But the joy of the people of Hajat, the people of India, was not shared by the Western oil multinationals. They refused to accept Uncle Ishwood crude for processing in their refineries, saying that the quality was not good enough. Yet another blatant lie. ONGC proposed to the government to set up its own refinery at Koyali to refine the crude from Uncle Ishwar. Given the threat of a refinery owned by Indians, the multinationals backed down. On the 15th of August, 1961, the first rake of tank wagons with about 10,000 barrels of crude oil left Uncle Ishwar for a multinational refinery in Bombay. Malavia's vision was taking shape. Uncle Ishwar continues to produce one of the best crudes in the world, even today, and is the first jewel in the crown of ONGC. Encouraged by this success, other prospects in Gujarat were drilled in quick succession. And by the end of 1963, a number of oil and gas fields were discovered. The geoscientists kept learning with each success and each disappointment. They found out throughout India, taking all the hardships in their stride. Nine, double six, 40 meter. Fire. Back home in Dehradun, laboratories were coming up, data processing systems were being set up, and new batches of geoscientists and engineers were being trained. In the meantime, in 1958, ONGC had also begun operations in Assam, and a drilling office was established at Sipsagar. As the drilling began here, hopes were high, for it was in Assam that the saga of oil in India had begun more than a hundred years ago. On a warm September afternoon in 1825, a young Lieutenant R. Wilcox of the 46th Regiment Native Infantry rode up the Bhuri Dihing River on a military survey mission. As the rainforest pressed down increasingly on the winding river, suddenly Wilcox saw oil rising to the surface at Subkong with great bubbling of gas and petroleum. The first commercial discovery of crude oil in the country was made when railway tracks were being laid by the Assam Railway and Trading Company Limited. The story goes that elephants would return from deep inside the jungle, their legs covered with a black and sticky substance. The excited owners of the elephants followed the footprints and found seepage of oil bubbling to the surface. W.L. Lake, an employee of the company, started drilling in September 1889. Folklore has it that Lake used to yell, dig boy dig, to encourage the workers. And with the passage of time, the place itself came to be known as Dig Boy. In November 1890, the well was completed and the initial production was 200 gallons per day. The oil industry of India was born. Finally, on the 10th of January, 1960, ONGC began drilling at this site near Rudrasagar. Gobind Chandra Goswami had joined ONGC in August 1959. He clearly remembers the day when they struck oil on the 28th of May, 1960. Goswami and his comrades had drilled for more than five months. Their efforts made Rudra Sagar the first discovery well of ONGC in the eastern region. In September 1965, Pakistan attacked India. The direction of the American tilt was known. 
One of the American oil multinationals tried to ground the Indian Air Force at the height of the war, but the false declaration that jet fuel of required quality was not available. Indian Oil Corporation, another creation of KD Malavia, saved the day, and the Indian Air Force continued to rule the skies. After this, nobody ever questioned the strategic vision of Pandit Nehru and Malavia to build India's own oil and gas industry. 1965 was also the year that ONGC formed a wholly owned subsidiary company called Hydrocarbons India Limited, which was to look after its operations abroad. 1970, a new era dawned. After a series of oil and gas discoveries onshore, ONGC decided to take up the challenge of offshore exploration, a whole new game of technology and skills. Alia Bait was a little-known name even on the map of Gujarat. The first offshore drilling operation was taken up by ONGC, and an indigenously built fixed platform was installed here at Alia Bait. Called Operation Leapfrog, the Alia Bait offshore drilling operation had its successful initiation with the release of the giant 500-ton rig break by the then Prime Minister of the country, Indira Gandhi, on the 19th of March, 1970. According to L.J. Johnson, then chairman ONGC, the occasion was of great significance because it gave ONGC a new stature. Again, like the first onshore well at Jwala Mukhi, the first offshore well at Alia Bait was a disappointment. But ONGC did not give up. Between 1964 to 1967, extensive seismic surveys had been carried out by a Soviet seismic vessel, academic Arka Jelensky, in the west coast of India. Geoscientists and engineers of ONGC geared up for offshore operations. Under the chairmanship of B.S. Negi, ONGC ordered India's first self-propelled jack-up rig, Sagar Samrat, from Japan, at a cost of 12.7 crore rupees in 1973. Sagar Samrat moved to a prospect 160 kilometers off Bombay. On the 19th of February, 1974, ONGC discovered the giant field of Bombay High. VR Koyande, all of 20 then, came from a coastal village near Goa. Eighteen years since formation, ONGC had come of age. In 1999, Sagar Samrat celebrated its silver jubilee. Sagar Samrat had drilled more than 130 wells and is ready to go strong for another 10 years. of January 2003, Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee conferred Petrotech's Lifetime Achievement Award to Dr. N.B. Prasad. He was the chairman who led ONGC to begin commercial production from Bombay High within 27 months, setting a world record in offshore development. On the 21st of May 1976, a tanker named after the visionary Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru took on board the first cargo of oil from Bombay High. In another two years, by the end of 1978, Bombay High was producing 100,000 barrels of oil per day. In 1981, the Commission celebrated its Silver Jubilee. By now, the production from ONGC's fields was meeting around 45% requirement of oil in the country saving 10 crore rupees a day in foreign exchange. After opening up the Kambe Basin in the western onshore and registering successes in the Assam-Arakan Basin in the northeast, 
ONGC opened up the Mumbai offshore basin, followed by the basins in Rajasthan, Krishna Godavari, and Kaveri. Five out of six producing basins in India have been opened up by the ONGC. Exploration and production involves big technology, big money, and big risk. As the sun set on Bombay High on the 30th of July, 1982, it was not known that a disaster was coming up. At about 9.30 p.m., a blowout happened in a well being drilled by ONGC's jack-up rig, Sagar Vikas. As oil and gas escaped, the rig was a total loss, but all the 74 men aboard the rig were rescued. It took one and a half months of hard work to kill the well and control the fire. But in five months, ONGC brought the platform back in production. The country stood by ONGC, and on the 2nd of August, 1982, Parliament expressed their best wishes and full support to the ONGC in their efforts to control the blowout successfully. In recognition of his exemplary leadership through the 80s, Colonel Wahi, the chairman, was conferred the award of Padma Bhushan by the President of India on the 19th of March, 1988. On the 1st of February, 1994, the Oil and Natural Gas Commission renewed itself as a corporation to bring in greater autonomy and better opportunities. 1996, Hydrocarbons India Limited was transformed into ONGC Videsh Limited. And today, this wholly owned subsidiary of ONGC owns properties in Vietnam, Russia, Myanmar, Iraq, Iran, Sudan, Libya, and Syria. 1997, ONGC became a Navratna public sector unit. And in the year 2000, the government of India declared it as a flagship oil PSU. 3rd April 2002, ONGC's market capitalization crossed 50,000 crore rupees. ONGC today is the most valuable company in India by market capitalization and net worth. For 2002-2003, ONGC became the first Indian company to register a net profit exceeding 10,000 crore rupees. In March 2003, ONGC acquired MRPL, realizing a long-held dream of forward integration to refining and marketing. On the 3rd of August 2003, ONGC announced the launch of its deep-sea exploration project, Sagar Samriti, targeting to discover and produce oil and gas from fields under water depths of up to three kilometers, from Alia Bet to Mumbai High to Sagar Samhiti. ONGC continues at the cutting edge of global technology. Today, a rejuvenated ONGC is ready to take off as a global energy provider. Almost half a century ago, Keshav Dev Malviya had warned that Prospecting and development of oil is a venture with no guarantee. But ONGC had accepted that challenge against all odds. And today, it is respected for its proven competence and confidence, redeeming the faith of Keshav Dev Malviya and the people of India.